funded or mobile HPC space uh, as part of our NSF Center for High Performance Reconfigurable Computing. Uh, we're oftentimes constrained in trying to uh, provide supercomputing in, in a very small space. And that, of course, has some energy uh, and power issues associated with that. All the way on up to a large scale uh, supercomputer uh, that we call Hokey Speed that I'll talk more about later. So with that um, as a backdrop, uh, I'll very quickly go through uh, some motivation, some context, and give you a broader vision. Um, a lot of this community, of course, is already aware of many of these things, but uh, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit here. So um, it was about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that we had something called the Japanese Air Simulator that came about. It uh, shattered. Uh, the number one, it shot to number one. It was five times faster than any other supercomputer out there in the world. And if you took the next 20 supercomputers in the world and added them together, it would equate to this single supercomputer. And this caused a lot of uh, heartburn, if you will, uh, in, in the sense that this is something that just, uh, it, was, it was so dramatic that people uh, dubbed this uh, event as Computenik. And if you don't know what that was referred to, it's a, it's a play on words with respect to the Sputnik and what the Russians uh, were, a, were able to do uh, in terms of uh, beating us uh, uh, out in up outer space. And so what ended up happening, uh, the, there was a reaction uh, uh, with respect to trying to figure out, well, right, the Japanese Earth Simulator is number one. But uh, is it really that important to be number one? Is high performance computing that important? And so there was a study that was done by the US Council of Competitiveness. It was sponsored by DOE and NSF. And what you see here is uh, the thing to pay attention to is just the, the blue sliver. There were only 3% of the companies that were part of the study that, could, that said they could exist and compete without high performance computing. Um, <clears throat> And there were 200 plus participating companies. Many of them were Fortune 500. Uh, for example, Procter and Gamble. Um, how many people know what Procter and Gamble is? <laughs> Where do we find Procter and Gamble? Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> Generally, like, we walk in a supermarket. Uh, probably as much as half of the things there are either made by or distributed by Procter and Gamble, Cincinnati, Ohio, or they don't necessarily call themselves Procter and Gamble; they call themselves P and G. Um, but you, you look at the back of you know, a lot of all of those products, and you'll see that. Um, and you say, well, why do they need high performance computing? Well, <clears throat> detergent. Or they want to uh, model the decay in terms of the, the aroma of the laundry detergent on the clothes. They don't want you to necessarily smell like mountain fresh air for an entire week or what have you. So they, they have it naturally ebb. Uh, the one that I thought was, uh, you've seen this probably before, is, is the Pringles potato chips. They do fluid dynamics over it to make sure that the, you know, the potato chips, when they fly off, they don't go flying off in all these different directions, but they fly off in such a way that you can stack them in the can. So with that as a backdrop, that's, I think you know, that helped reinvigorate the high performance computing environment um, until uh, we have arguably another compute nick that potentially had occurred. If you take a look back, it's uh, not too long ago that uh, uh, people argued that Compute NIC 2 occurred. Um, I didn't really view it that way. It was only 43% faster than the number one supercomputer. But I think the reason why such attention was brought to it was because of a couple of things. One, it was uh, China had, had shot to the top, and they hadn't been there before. Uh, the other thing is, is it was $20 million cheaper and it was 42% less power consumption than the previous number one supercomputer. The other thing that it did, uh, well, okay, so let me see. So that's what people viewed it as. I didn't really view it as Compute NIC 2, but if anything, it's the second coming of the Beowulf cluster. And, and that is the further commoditization of HBC. So how did the Chinese achieve this? They were able to do this by uh, leveraging the commoditization of the graphics processing unit. Okay. And that's how they were able to get this uh, supercomputer to be uh, so much cheaper and 42% uh, less power consuming. Okay. And that's really what uh, the, the rest of the talk is today. Um, just as a further quick backdrop for those that uh, 
uh, it shows my age, maybe uh, many of you probably may not remember what a Beowulf cluster is or what it refers to. It was the idea was to utilize commodity PCs to build a supercomputer. Because back in the 80s and 90s, or 70s, 80s, and 90s, you usually looked at a supercomputer as a big iron resource that only the few and fortunate had access to. And this was a way to get your own uh, supercomputer put together. You just leverage commodity PCs, leverage Linux operating system, uh, and, uh, to, uh, and gigabit ethernet, or not gigabit ethernet, there was no gigabit ethernet, <laughs> fast ethernet at the time to, to put together your PC. And you'd have a rack, you'd have a rack like that uh, um, uh, to support that. Um, we didn't have 1U or 2U or 4U servers <laughs> at the time back then. So what the uh, second coming is simply, well, we're doing the same thing again, except we're leveraging commodity graphics processing units to build a supercomputer. Okay. So with that as a backdrop, um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk today about what we're doing towards moving t to an ecosystem for heterogeneous parallel computing. Uh, the one that I'll uh, point out, and this is uh, some uh, gratuitous self-promotion here, is uh, Hokie Speed, which is a GPU accelerated supercomputer that we debuted uh, in November 2011. Uh, it was number 96 in the top 500 for uh, a budget that was three orders of magnitude less than the number one supercomputer on the top 500. Um, uh, and it was the highest ranked commodity supercomputer in the US on the Green 500 at the time. So we want to create that ecosystem not only for this environment, but also for uh, the environments with which we work in for the NSF Center for High Performance Reconfigurable Computing. And in fact, what you're going to see today had its genesis here, moved up to here in the HPC area, and now we're trying to push this back down uh, into the commodity parts. So we want this uh, enabling software framework that tunes the parameters of hardware devices with respect to various metrics in terms of performance and arguably pro programmability and portability in order to enhance productivity of these computing environments. Not per se per, for, for the computer scientists, but more for the application scientists, the computational scientists and engineer. And we're doing this uh, through a, via, uh, a benchmark suite of dwarfs or motifs and mini apps. I won't be talking about that in this uh, portion of the talk, but you'll, you'll see it in the higher level overview, which I'm going to show in the uh, next slide. So this was a, <coughs> a collaboration with uh, some composite folks uh, uh, at Virginia Tech. We were looking towards trying to support some exascale work that uh, uh, th th there's uh, some uh, collaborating work at uh, DOE National Lab that uh, the scientists there were looking for us to help support. And so uh, this was in terms of the design of composite structure. So we're analyzing the composites of, say, uh, bombs or missiles or what have you. And we wanted to understand what the potential for fractures and fatigue and what have you were of those, um, those devices. And so <coughs> uh, there are some various principles that were involved in the design of the composite structures that are then supported by mathematical algorithms and some verification and validation and uncertainty quantification that that's stick, stuck into an exascale simulation framework. You've probably seen many different versions of this in, in, in other contexts. And part of their issue is, is that they uh, have lots and lots of code. Uh, you're talking about millions of lines of code between the, the DOE lab as well as uh, our own lab uh, at Virginia Tech. Our own lab meaning uh, the aerospace and uh, material science engineers. Um, and they wanted the ecosystem, an ecosystem that would enable them to uh, more easily run on top of these new emerging heterogeneous parallel computing platforms. And so <clears throat> What I show you here is merely a vision of what I'd like to have in terms of the software ecosystem. And, and I want to say it's, it's very appropriate to be here at Charm++ because I think that the Charm++ is already, they, they have a lot of this ecosystem in place. And hopefully maybe some of this stuff can be uh, integrated or, or we can collaborate and incorporate these aspects into uh, Charm++. Um, <clears throat> But we, we're looking at the red boxes in here are, are things that the software ecosystem will do at design uh, and compile time. And the purple boxes are things that are done at runtime. Uh, 
this is a vision. Uh, right now, the way it works is I, I have automated pieces in each of these different boxes. But in actuality, these lines that interconnect many of these uh, pieces are often manually done. They're manually stitched together. Okay. And so we're working toward this vision. But the vision's still not quite there. We then later found out that uh, not only with respect to the composite structures, we also have uh, a, a number of other application areas that we're interested in running on these platforms. And so we've been working with biologists uh, in the sequence alignment short read mapping uh, area, um, molecular modeling and dynamics, so the biophysicists, biochemists, um, earthquake mo modeling, uh, so with seismologists and geologists, um, Neuroinformatics, uh, which uh, we're looking at uh, um, trying to infer uh, higher order motor function uh, from synapsis firings, and then the avionics composites that I just talked about. So <clears throat> I spent quite a bit of time giving you an intro and motivation in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so let's uh, go ahead and start to drill in on this software ecosystem. And I will also note that this is a uh, intranode ecosystem. Um, there is quite a bit of work down here I said, about supporting an internode ecosystem, but I'm not going to get to it. Uh, for those that have interest, uh, I, I, you could try and do a Google search. So I'm having you not pay attention to my talk by doing Google search, but, but uh, you can look, at, uh, look up Streamer, uh, Vocal, which is Virtual OpenCL, uh, or MPIACC, which is uh, MPI for Accelerated Systems. Um, so we're going to focus on the internode, and in particular, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the, these two boxes. I'll be focusing on these four boxes out here, and I'll be giving you just a uh, overview, uh, brief touch on each one of those boxes to give you a feel in terms of what it is that we're doing towards supporting uh, what the, the scientists up here are, are needing or wanting. And so in terms of the codes that they're working on, uh, the codes that come in from an intranode perspective, uh, they're written in pthreads, CUDA, and OpenMP. And when we were working with the composite structure folks, uh, they had made the commitment and deep dive to translate their codes to CUDA. Uh, I'm sorry. They had their... Ah, I, I said that wrong. They, they, they had their codes in OpenMP. Uh, the, the ones that had it in CUDA were uh, the molecular modeling and molecular dynamics folks. They had, they had spent quite a bit of time doing that. And so <clears throat> they started to wonder what, what the um, portability of the code would be in terms of running on different platforms. So pthreads would, and OpenMP were, there, were, were largely supported on on many different types of platforms, uh, although one would argue this was only uh, on CPUs at the time. And then with CUDA, it was only NVIDIA GPUs. And so they were worried about the, the narrowness of their code and their ability to, uh, to run it on different uh, platforms. And so what we started out with uh, first was looking at CUDA and seeing what we could do with respect to supporting, uh, supporting uh, users that would want to run on other platforms. And so if you take a look at programming GPUs, uh, there's NVIDIA's proprietary framework that popularized GPU programming. And uh, they're programmed in a C-like language. And then there's OpenCO, which is an open standard for heterogeneous parallel computing. Uh, it was, it's vendor agnostic, vendor neutral. It also uses C-like language. And it can be used in CP, uh, GPUs, CPUs, and FPGAs. Amp, yeah, 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 yeah. We have not taken a look at that yet. That's that's a good point. And, and I, I uh, uh, the 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 work that's that's done here makes he heavy use of uh, Clang and LLV. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna f uh, talk about that uh, uh, very soon. Uh, I, I am not a uh, so, <laughs> so some disclaimer is that I'm not a compiler person or source you know, source of source translator person. But what I found was a niche and need for supporting the uh, application here, and you're gonna see what we did uh, in terms of supporting them uh, for the uh, the OpenCL ecosystem. Um, we have uh, an open dwarfs project now that is things that are written in OpenCL. We were able to run it on CPUs, uh, G 
GPUs, FPGAs, and DSPs right now. So <clears throat> just uh, this is by no means, uh, 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 this is more anecdotal. It's not scientifically rigorous. But if you take a look, if you did a Google search on Google, a Google source code, you see that you've got millions of hits. And with OpenCL, uh, you've got uh, an order of magnitude less of hits. So uh, that's partly because uh, OpenCL came about 18 to 24 months afterward. It's a much lower level. Uh, well, they're both low level. CUDA and OpenCL are both low level. But o OpenCL is arguably even more low level than, than CUDA. And so if you take a look at this, uh, uh, how CUDA has really shaped uh, the landscape. It's, they've done an amazing job uh, in terms of uh, traction in a myriad of fields from molecular dynamics, computational chemistry, to oil and gas, to financial computing, uh, to general uh, mathematical tools uh, like Mathematica and MATLAB and so on. All right. So what we're looking to do here is <coughs> We want to support the application scientists, okay. uh, the ones that have invested the time in writing in CUDA, uh, or even writing in OpenCL. And the idea is that, with respect to the CUDA, we want them to be, be able to run on NVIDIA GPUs, but we also have this CUDA to OpenCL source to source translator, which is short for, uh, we shortened it for, uh, say, cuticle, so CUDA to OpenCL, uh, to run on other devices. And in fact, uh, I should draw this so that it runs uh, also on NVIDIA. GPU devices, we, we have it running on there as well. So <clears throat> we wanted to seek to address both, uh, both the stakeholders uh, in terms of newbies wanting to tap into existing treasure trove of uh, CUDA accelerated applications that you just saw on the previous page, uh, as well as uh, seasoned experts or veterans that were looking to leverage their CUDA investment. Okay. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to give you a really broad level uh, overview of what we did. Um, this is called the uh, cuticle. It's implemented as a Clang plugin uh, to uh, leverage its production quality framework. Okay. And it covers the primary CUDA constructs found in CUDA C and the CUDA runtime uh, API. And the end result was that we had codes that were automatically translated uh, that performed as well as the manually ported codes uh, from CUDA to OpenCL. Uh, there have been others uh, that folks have been asking us to take a look at, um, OpenCL to CUDA, OpenMP to OpenCL, but by far this one has been the most popular. In fact, this, this morning I had three more, <laughs> three more requests come in for, for this code. We're actually going to release this as a binary in the near future, probably in the next two or three weeks, uh, for folks to play with. Um, so I'll buzz through this. Why, why did we do this? I already said that there's a lot of apps implemented in CUDA other than OpenCL. We want to leverage their investment. Uh, the issues are for domain scientists, writing from scratch, OpenCL is too low level, and porting from CUDA can be tedious and error prone. So if we take a look at why it could be tedious and error prone, you take a look at the initialization code for CUDA. Um, this is on the host side, the CPU side, and this is the initialization code uh, on OpenCL side, for, uh, open, with OpenCL on the host side. So as you set up the compute environment, uh, platforms, devices, contexts, uh, command queues, and so on. If you take a look at the device side, this is for uh, LU decomposition. It factors a matrix as a product of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. This is what you would do in CUDA. Uh, it's uh, nine lines of code. And this is what you would do uh, in OpenCL with 14 lines elided here. So <clears throat> there's significant demand from <clears throat> our major stakeholders for this. Um, part of the reason for not doing it is people say, well, just start with OpenCL. Uh, but I think that that, that argument's going away. A lot of people are viewing this as just being simply too low level a uh, uh, language. Uh, right now, we're only doing source-to-source -source translation. So what we're trying to get towards is functional or code portability. And we're largely ignoring performance portability. Um, and the performance portability only is supported from the perspective of if you take the CUDA code, say you're running on an NVIDIA GTX uh, Titan, or no, uh, yeah, GTA, uh, NVIDIA Titan uh, GPU. 
and you translate it to OpenCL, uh, you'll get the same performance on the same hardware device, approximately within 5%. Um, the issue of performance portability becomes a, a more of an issue when you're translating it from CUDA to OpenCL, uh, but you're running that OpenCL code on a different target architecture because the original source uh, will more than likely have been optimized for that original source architecture. So this is, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into great detail with this. and. Uh, uh, I'm not a compiler person, so I would, I would defer to, to <laughs> the compiler experts in the room. Um, yeah, so, but this is the high-level uh, cuticle translation uh, framework um, to translate, uh, automatically translate OpenCL codes uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, automatically translate CUDA codes into OpenCL uh, host and kernel files. And it takes as input uh, the the, uh, CUDA applica uh, the application's CUDA source files and rewrites them into semantically equivalent uh, OpenCL uh, host and kernel files. And in the process, it adds all the boilerplate that you saw on the previous slides okay, so that, that the end user doesn't have to deal with the initialization code on the host and, and the very verbose uh, uh, device code uh, on the GPU device. Uh, it's a Clang plugin that ties into the main driver and allows Clang to handle parsing and parsing and AST generation. Um, uh, and then uh, Cuticle just takes over and walks the generated AST, uh, abstract syntax tree, uh, to do the rewrites. We're not doing any transformations on the AST for optimization purposes. We're not, per se, translating it down to intermediate representation. We're just walking the tree and doing a source-to-source -source translation. And part of that is because by doing that, it keeps the structure of the code, including all the comments and things like that, the way that it was in the original source code so that people can continue to develop on it. Now we can then take that OpenCL source code and, and stick it right back in uh, and, and do a translation to some intermediate representation and do all the back-end optimizations, but that's really for, uh, this, I'm already reaching with respect to my expertise in, in, in building systems, so this is something that I'm, I'm hoping that we have more uh, uh, compiler experts out there that we'll uh, look at uh, doing. <clears throat> so this is just, uh, uh, we've translated uh, 99 uh, uh, CUDA, to opens, uh, CUDA uh, source codes from the CUDA SDK, the Rodinia benchmark suite, and five uh, major uh, large-scale applications that were over 10,000 lines in code. Uh, including this one that was an n-body molecular modeling code. It was about 10,000 lines of code, um, of which 2,500 of it were CUDA lines of code. And when we stuck it through the source-to-source -source translator, we only ended up having to uh, change manually change five lines of the code uh, in order to get it to run in OpenCL. And you'll see uh, some very brief results on the performance aspects of that code that was, uh, that was translated. So I just gave you a high-level overview of, of, of what we did in terms of uh, the source-to-source -source translation. And you can take a look at uh, a few of these publications for additional details. Now, one of the things I said was we are striving toward functional or code portability so that people can run it on different devices. And, and we've been able to run our, our codes on a, a myriad of devices, of CPUs, GPUs, uh, APUs, which are accelerated processing units to put CPUs and GPUs together, as well as uh, FPGAs. Uh, what I said, though, is, is that we are not guaranteeing uh, performance portability. And that's where these architecture-aware uh, optimizations end up coming in at design and compile time. Okay. And so this is what uh, I'll talk about next very briefly. Uh, this shouldn't come as a surprise, and this is a little bit dated. I need to update it. Um, uh, computational units aren't created equal. Um, and, and if you take a look at uh, NVIDIA versus AMD, just in terms of the peak performance, uh, I only have it out to 2010, but it, it has pretty much the same trajectory. In terms of the peak performance, you'll see that the AMD GPU uh, has uh, more flops, if you will, uh, floating point operations per second than the NVIDIA system does. Um, 
And in this particular case, when we compared it to a hand-tuned SSE accelerated code, uh, we got a 328-fold speed up on an older card. When we ran that code on the newer, faster card with more cores, you see that there's a slight performance degradation. And again, that has to do not so much because the hardware is any worse, it's simply because the software that was written on this particular device was tuned for this architecture. Okay. And this will also dovetail, by the way, into the panel a little bit about can software control everything in terms of uh, the energy. Um, so, uh, and furthermore, then we did it over on the AMD 5870, there was a 32% uh, performance degradation. So, it turns out that this, this performance degradation is actually pretty, uh, is not so bad, because if we ended up taking out all the optimizations, uh, this, this number would come down to about 88-fold faster than the hand-tuned SSE. So there was some number of optimizations that spanned across the different GPU architectures that allowed us to get this 224-fold speed up. So I'm going to skip over that. Um, all right, I'm going to skip over and get uh, get to this one. So this is uh, what I was saying. So it turns out that if we were to strip out all of the architecture, uh, the the optimizations, and just gone with a basic uh, naive uh, approach toward uh, parallelization, we would only get an 88-fold speed up on the the older AMD uh, 5870 and a 163-fold speed up on this older GTX 280. And then when we did architecture underwear, all we did was we said, well, the optimizations that we would apply on the AMD, we applied it uh, onto the NVIDIA platform. And the optimizations that we would normally apply on the NVIDIA, we just applied on the GPU. And so we got, we, it shows some level of uh, architecture uh, independent optimizations that would get us to 192 and 224 forward speed up. Now, when we went to the AMD one, there, there's a lot of work that was done, uh, a lot of excellent uh, uh, work that was done in terms of optimizing NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, we were able to leverage that as well for our own uh, ecosystem uh, for NVIDIA accelerated GPUs. So our Hokey speed is all NVIDIA uh, GPU accelerators. Um, but what was less known at the time was with respect to optimization techniques or AMD GPUs. And so, uh, we did a number of optimizations that uh, we found that didn't necessarily work well on the NVIDIA platform. And in some cases, it actually performed worse. Uh, and applied them to the AMD GPU. And in this particular case, one of the differences from an architectural standpoint, this was a VLIW architecture rather than scalar architecture that the NVIDIA platform had had. And so it turns out that these particular optimizations had a tremendous effect on what the ultimate performance ended up being. So, uh, kernel splitting, the, the, the penalty, and I, I don't have it quantified in this talk, the penalty for doing conditionals it, on the GPU and the AMD uh, GPU was much, much higher than on the uh, NVIDIA platform. And so we looked to ensure that we could uh, do some level of kernel splitting, and that is pulling the conditionals out of the GPU, having the conditionals uh, hosted on the CPU side, and then there was just a whole myriad of different kernels uh, that would be launched directly off of the CPU. So pulling that out, uh, doing local staging of data, which is actually a st uh, a standard across uh, both types of GPU architectures. But the use of vector types and image memory also came into, into, into play. And so I, I'm not going to go through all of these optimizations. This is just a key down here. Um, uh, MT is maximizing the number of threads. KS is the kernel splitting that I just talked about. RA's register accumulator, RP's register preloading, and so on and so forth. There's the standard loop unrolling, two-way and four-way unrolling. Uh, and then different types of access to the data, uh, vectorized access with scalar math and vectorized access with vector math. Vector. You said that some of the optimizations hurt performance of the NVIDIA GPUs. Yeah. Which ones were those? Um, <laughs> the... Good question. Um, I want to say it's uh, the use of the, the vectorized access and the vector uh, vector math. Um, it was, 
I'm pretty sure that's what, what one of them were. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I, I'd have to go back and take a look. It is in, it would be in the paper that I will be showing, I think, uh, at, right after I finish this, this section up. I'll, I'll, it's, uh, oh, yeah. Data type. Uh, do you know why does the uh, AMD GPU have like vector units? Um, I mean like regular vector units, not uh, multiple thread units. Um, I, I don't know why they did it that way. I mean, I think it's probably just a holdover from what they had when they bought ATI and they didn't really work on the architecture um, extensively. They, they're more recent. Uh, uh, the most recent revision of the GPU has moved away from a VLIW architecture, which would you know, force you to try and fill the, the, the v very long instruction word um, to, to extract the parallelism uh, at, at compile time. Um, they've since gone to something called the Graphics Core Next architecture, which is much more in line with uh, what NVIDIA is doing in terms of its scalar architecture. And in fact, we just submitted a paper last night <laughs> uh, that w was pointing out that it turns out that there's a convergence in a lot of the architecture-aware uh, optimizations that are now span across the d both of the different GPU uh, GPU architectures. Yeah. So, what is image memory? Is that just the texture? Is this is that you're referring to, or are you referring to something else? Um, it's, it's, it's a small local memory that's on the GPU. Uh, I, 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 don't know, I don't remember exactly the, the correlation between the, the terminology on the NVIDIA side and the OpenCL side, but it's a small, small read-only um, so image. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you have any sentence why um, it's different, I guess? That's a good question that I, I, don't, have, I don't have the insights for that. We, we basically applied these. Um, and looked at w what the ramifications would be in terms of the different optimizations, but we didn't d dig deeper uh, in terms of doing this. And in fact, this is part of a, it's a good question. In fact, this is part of a master's thesis that first I said, well, what do I do for, for a PhD if I do it? And I <laughs> it's answering the kind of questions that you just brought up. <clears throat> yeah, because one of the problems about the scale is that they don't provide, at least they didn't, maybe they have it now, but they didn't recently have support for 1D. Uh, which which CUDA does. Yeah, in fact, that that's one of the. I mean, I, uh, not to get too uh, uh, sidetracked, but one of the things that the, many of the challenges with respect to the CUDA to OpenCL source to source translator is that there isn't an equivalent on the OpenCL side, and so that creates some issues. And that's part of the reason why we have some of the issues that we have in terms of translating from CUDA to OpenCL. Um, one of the other ones that, that really stands out in terms of things that we got tripped up on quite a bit are folks that use um, the thread fence in CUDA in order to synchronize, effectively synchronize between blocks between streaming multiprocessors. There's no equivalent in OpenCL, and that ends up breaking a lot of codes uh, because they're trying to do the synchronization on the GPU without having to move back to the CPU, and there's no equivalent in OpenCL. Um, <clears throat> see here. Uh, so this is just the, uh, so this is what I had my human compiler do. Uh, this is part of a, a master student that went through and, and, and did these. And, and there were actually closer to about 20 different optimizations that we had laid out for, for him to look at. And these are just a summary view of, of how the, the speed up was relative to the hand tune. Uh, I'm sorry, relative to our uh, original basic um, parallelization. So it's it's relative to um, this one here, this orange box, uh, the 88 fold on the AMD platform, and we're optimizing for that platform. So <clears throat> that is correct. That is correct. That is correct. This is not relative to the architecture This is. Oh, oh, oh I, I, I see what you're saying. The, so so the, the, the baseline, thank you. Uh, I, I, they're intermixed. So, uh, so what I did was the basic ones. And then what we did was uh, we went ahead and added uh, the ones that were already there on the, when we did the translation. Those were already added in. And that, was, that got us to the, the 220, 224. And then on top of that, uh, 
so, uh, let me rephrase that. So some of the ones that you see on the next slide are architecture independent. Some of them are architecture dependent. I, they're intermixed. Okay. Um, so we're going to go from 88-fold, and we're going to get up to uh, another level here that I'll, I'll get back to in a minute. So, um, so, so, so for example, local staging of data is something that you would also do on the NVIDIA a GPU device. So they're, they're intermixed in here. Um, so we did these in isolation. Um, uh, and then when we did them in combination, you know, it would be wonderful if uh, this was a multiplicative <laughs> speed up, but it's not. When you combine them, the, 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 some of them have uh, uh, incompatibilities and uh, work against one another. But in general, what happens is, I'm going to skip over this. Whoops. In general, what happens is that uh, in in terms of getting the speed up on this particular platform, we had to combine maximizing the number of threads with kernel splitting, uh, register uh, preloading, and the use of image memory in order to get a uh, 4.2x fold speed up. And so with that speed up, what ends up happening is that uh, we go from 224 fold, or actually 88 fold, which is what I was talking about before, times 4.2, when you combine the architecture independent and architecture war optimizations, it got up to a 371 fold speed up, which at the time is 12% better than uh, the uh, NVIDIA uh, GTX uh, 280, which was a 328 fold. Okay. Now, this is not to say that one's better than the other in this case. Okay, in fact, like I said before, I, for our our own GPU accelerated system, we went with NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, we wanted the we wanted an ecosystem that had a richer set of tools and and uh, uh, expressiveness in terms of the codes and not have to be um, burdened by having to deal with the grunge of of, of OpenCL. Right. Right, so you can uh, <coughs> see a number of. Uh, uh, the work in the area of architectural optimizations in the following uh, publications. This is actually a book chapter in uh, uh, GPU Computing Gems that was uh, edited by your own, very own Wenmei Hu, um, and a couple of jur uh, journal and uh, several conference publications. Ideally, what we'd like, and it's not something that I, I intend to do, uh, I would like to see done, is of course take those architectural optimizations and and automatically apply them into the the cuticle translator, any source to source translator that we may be uh, working on. I'm going to talk uh, some briefly about some performance and power models that could be used to drive uh, or guide these architecture wear optimizations, uh, as well as guide decisions that are made at runtime for the task scheduling system. Uh, I'm going to talk about this at, again at a high level uh, with. Uh, a, a, a model that I'll throw up uh, just to give you an idea of some of the lower level details that are going on in the background. Um, so we're looking for a robust framework that has high accuracy and in, the most important thing is this identification of portable predictors for performance and power. Um, and then do a multi-dimensional characterization on the performance and power both sequentially, uh, intranode parallel, intranode parallel but then also look at it uh, with respect to power down to as low a level as the component level, like the CPU, uh, the memory subsystem, or what we, some folks are referring to as the core versus the uncore. Um, and by identifying uh, portable predictors, uh, we'll be able to better solve these types of problems where you're taking energy and uh, you're minimizing energy subject to meeting certain uh, certain deadline, relative deadline. This is set up as an absolute deadline, but we ultimately refactor it as a, a relative deadline. Uh, and that work is conserved and, and time, is, time is greater than z uh, or equal to zero. And so what we do is we're looking at a program that's executed for a certain time uh, at certain settings with a total energy usage of E that's minimized such that these constraints are met. Uh, this is refactored as a... Uh, uh, performance model where we infer, you don't need to worry too much about the math. The point is, is that we're doing a relative performance slowdown. So this is the time it takes for running at a particular uh, lesser frequency divided by the time to run at a maximum frequency and subtracted by one. So it's a percentage slowdown. 
um, we reformulate a, a, a traditional two coefficient performance model into a single coefficient, and this beta is computed at runtime, and it gives you an idea of the CPU boundedness of a job. So if beta goes toward one, then you have a CPU uh, bound job. If beta goes toward zero, you have a memory bound job. And by doing that, that allows you to get some idea of, uh, of what you can do with things like dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Uh, which is another talk, for, uh, but uh, that one, uh, you can see the reference for that one. Um, this, this actually worked out quite well. So, so we set this up as an intranode. Uh, remember I said everything was intranode. Uh, and in fact, we did set up as, as intranode, but I, I, I bleeded an internode uh, result in here. Um, so this is just showing that uh, we set the performance slowdown service level agreement to be 5%. Uh, and it was met in all cases except these two. It, it violated it just by a little bit. Um, and that was a, over some overhead associated with solving the linear uh, uh, optimization problem. So we'd have to tweak that a little bit. But the point here was is that this was, uh, uh, it delivered a 20% on average uh, energy reduction. And in, and in some cases, in this particular case, uh, there was a performance improvement that we didn't go further down and drill down and, and, and look at. This is on older uh, systems, and if we take a look at uh, a newer system, this is uh, something that was done by a, a colleague student. Uh, you take a look, these are from the NAS parallel benchmarks, and you see time here that's in the, in the bar graphs, and you see energy as the line graph. And so you, you kind of see what you expect here in terms of, on the x-axis, the number of CPUs in the first of the two tuple, a tuple and then threads per CPU in the, the second uh, tu tuple. Uh, in general, performance improves uh, and energy consumption is, is relatively static. Uh, what was a little bit more worrisome is when we looked at the IS benchmark, the integer sort benchmark. Uh, this is a case where running on a single CPU and a single thread per CPU gave you the best performance as well as the lowest energy consumption. So. I talked about having a robust framework that has portable performance and uh, predictors to, to correlate. And so with respect to this, what happened was that what happened was that that was a pre-Nehalem uh, processor. And in the pre-Nehalem processor, the portable predictor, at least on those architectures, was the level three data cache misses. So you could correlate the performance and the uh, with respect to the, the, the number of L3 data cache misses. However, uh, we're looking for more reliable predictors as we move forward and re we're revisiting these performance counters that are used for prediction because it turns out that when we went to the Halem, they took the memory controller and they put it onto, uh, on, on chip. They inter it's an in integrated memory controller. And it turned out that, uh, and we looked at these benchmarks again and we did it on Westmere, uh, which was the successor to, to the Halem. And we looked at it to see if, indeed, there was this correlation with respect to the L3 data cache misses, which is what we were looking to do in terms of extending the work that we showed on the previous slide that was pre nehalem And much to our surprise, uh, when we did this uh, Pearson correlation, uh, for perf uh, correlation coefficient for performance, we found that there's an anti-correlation now. Before, there was a performance correlation between the last level data cache misses and performance. And the Pearson correlation coefficient shows that as you increase, uh, as, as you approach one, there's a high correlation between performance and the particular performance counter. This, uh, this pre nehalem used to be upwards of 0.8 to 1.0. When we ran it on uh, Nehalem after, after Nehalem, in particular on the Westmere, the correlation was an anti-correlation. But instead, what happened was that if you look all the way to the right, you'll see that there's a very high correlation uh, between uh, the performance counters with respect to uh, the outstanding bus request cycles and the outstanding write cycles. Um, and so we're now using, instead of using this uh, predictor with respect to uh, core 2.0, core 2 days, uh, you're, 
you do not want to associate uh, performance prediction with that. Instead, you want to be looking at, at these particular sets of performance counters in order to predict your performance. OK, so um, there's a number of uh, publications you could take a look at uh, with respect to uh, the performance and power modeling work. Um, I'm going to uh, finally shift into this task scheduling system. Uh, work that uh, we've been doing uh, for adaptive runtime systems. And the idea here with this heterogeneous task scheduling is you want to automatically spread tasks across heterogeneous compute resources. So CPUs, GPUs, APUs, FPGAs, DSPs. Uh, we're currently working on a platform that has CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs in it. Um, we want to specify tasks at a higher level. Um, so there's a transition here. You can, this is where you can see where that vision picture is, is, is kind of cobbled together. I was originally talking about CUDA to OpenCL. And in fact, we were looking to do things in OpenCL runtime. But for the time being, uh, for convenience and proof of concept, we ended up doing this heterogeneous task scheduler uh, in OpenMP with uh, its extensions. And the idea is you want to run uh, available resources across uh, the, re uh, the different types of uh, heterogeneous processing units uh, automatically. And that's what the, uh, the goal is. And you don't want the end user to do it um, themselves. Right, so this is what we're doing. We're not replacing the CPU or GPU scheduler on the processor. Uh, we're introducing a shim layer that is simply deciding where to allocate the different uh, tasks on the CPU or GPU without uh, uh, intervention by the, by the end user. Um, so I, s I noted that instead of OpenCL, we're, we were prototyping this one in accelerated OpenMP. Um, it's something that, uh, uh, that we've, we're working with vendors to push into a generic runtime system in order to support both OpenMP and OpenCL and other intranode uh, uh, environments. But for the time being, we were just showing it as a proof of concept with uh, Open, whoa. With uh, accelerated OpenMP, um, accelerated OpenMP, uh, or, or hopefully in the OpenMP 4.0 standard that will be released this year, uh, uh, and then we want to automatically divide parallel tasks across uh, arbitrary resources uh, uh, for uh, functional portability, and then do runtime task scheduling for the performance portability aspect, and so. <coughs> We ended up going with Accelerate OpenMP initially is because uh, our avionics composites people already had their code in OpenMP. They didn't have it in CUDA. And so they have their code written like this already. And so they have these accelerator, uh, OpenMP accelerator directives where the pragma is expanded a little bit to specify what you copy in and out and uh, what you do in terms of copying both in and out. Uh, we extended it with a hetero clause, and the hetero clause simply indicates that uh, if this condition is zero, then you're running on the accelerator only. If it's one, then you're running, you're truly running heterogeneously, you're running both on the CPU and the GPU. Uh, scheduler, you'll see what, uh, in the coming slides, ratio is what ratio of work to put on the CPU versus the GPU, and the divider is how uh, at what granularity you divide up an accelerator region with respect to doing uh, scheduling and analysis. And I'll talk more about that uh, in the last few slides here. So um, accelerator, uh, this is a, the Pragma OpenMP parallel for a, a CPU team of threads and then a GPU team of threads. There's an implicit barrier, of course, at the end of each one. Uh, this is all review, so I'm just going to buzz through this. Uh, the idea is that you want to make use of both resources if you can. Uh, the danger is, is that if, if you make both use of both resources at the same time, if one resource finishes before the other, then you have a wait uh, here at the end. Okay. And so the trick is, so here we use a static scheduler. A naive way is to split the work uh, on both and then uh, do the barrier. But then what may happen in this particular case, so we, we split the half on work on both. That's half and half. Uh, but the danger here is that the GPU unit ends up waiting quite a bit on the, on the CPUs. Uh, and this is a static scheduler. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. 
uh, we then are looking at doing it dynamically, and we're trying to minimize the amount of time that uh, is spent uh, running over the equal amount of time running on different CPUs uh, and GPUs, and this amount of time spent uh, running less than the equal amount of time on CPUs and GPUs. So by minimizing it, we're going to get a perfectly balanced workload across the CPUs and the GPUs. Um, and so by solving that uh, linear uh, uh, linear optimization problem, uh, we come up with a number of schedulers that make use of that uh, linear optimization problem, uh, linear optimization uh, problem, and uh, we simply use these uh, schedulers and these arguments, ratio, initial split to use, ratio between CPU and GPU performance, as well as uh, div, which is how far to subdivide a particular region. Okay, so the dynamic scheduler, uh, pictorially what happens is in the first pass, you split it up evenly, and you learn uh, in terms of the amount of time that you spend over an equal distribution on CPU or GPU and spend uh, underneath, uh, in this case, underneath the equal amount of time on the CPU and GPU, and you try to minimize it through that uh, linear optimization. And then in the second pass, uh, you redistribute the work. In this case, 900 go to the GPU and 100 go to the, the CPU. Uh, the split scheduler makes use of the div ratio. So in addition to splitting it half and half, uh, you're splitting that region, which is 500 iterations, into four pieces so that you can do uh, a total of four scheduling instances. And so after the uh, static scheduler occurs, then after uh, the first quarter is done, then you solve that problem and do dynamic uh, uh, um, scheduling for the rest of it. Um, Quick is a hybrid between the dynamic and the uh, uh, the, the, the dynamic and the uh, split. Uh, so uh, we take a quarter of it and we do the static scheduling, and then we do the rest of it as as a dynamic scheduler, and then we stay with that uh, dynamic scheduler uh, for the rest of the passes. And this helps to reduce on the overhead in terms of having to solve that linear optimization problem uh, too often. Yes. That is correct. That is correct, yes. Um, so we did this on a number of benchmarks. Um, uh, there, you know, there's some caveats, and, and you've, uh, you're implicitly getting at one of the caveats, but I'm not, I'm not, I, I'll address that afterward uh, in the interest of time here. But there's a, there's a number of benchmarks that we chose. We specifically chose them to stress the runtime system uh, to, to, uh, to work at different extremes. And... Uh, this is our environment, 12 uh, uh, cores, uh, AMD CPU, NVIDIA, Tesla, GPU. Um, I, I'm just going to give you this overview in terms of the performance results. So it turns out that uh, for the Helmholtz, you see here, everything's normalized with respect to the CPU performance being 1. Okay. And CPU performance being 1, we ran it, I compared it to 12 core. It's already been paralyzed on 12 cores of the CPUs. So you see that for the Helmholtz uh, uh, benchmark, it runs fastest on the CPU. Okay. Uh, when we run on the GPU, it's the slowest. And then what happens is that in these particular cases, the adaptive runtime system eventually figures out that all of the tasks should be thrown back onto the CPU. So what ends up up here is simply the overhead involved in terms of determining that. Uh, at the flip end, this is the end body problem, it turns out that all the all of the iterations go out onto the GPU. Okay. And so uh, you see that there's a upwards of about, uh, so vir virtually everything goes there. So you can see that uh, um, uh, the GPU and the different uh, dynamic schedulers uh, give you about an eight-fold speed up. And then there's the, these two uh, conjugate gradient k-means where there's some mixture of CPU and GPU uh, iterations that are split across both of them. And for that, uh, you can see that uh, in, in an IPDBS paper uh, last year. So there's a, a lot of more work, uh, a lot more work to do. Uh, it's, this is just a vision for an ecosystem. It's unlikely that I, myself, uh, or my group will, will spend, for example, time on, on integrating these particular pieces since we don't really have that expertise. We're spending more of our time down here in the runtime system. Um, but uh, there's quite a bit of work to be done. There's a number of people that are involved in this project um, that uh, 
uh, I'll, I'll get to at the end. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over, um, let's see here, this new PowerPoint doesn't seem to let me jump. Oh, there we go. Uh, go to slide. Um, let me jump to the end here. Um, oops. So I skipped over. Unfortunately, I skipped over a lot of the um, the in, or all of the internode stuff. Um, you, I can talk about that offline, but uh, we're. We're taking the intranode work and the internode work, putting them together and uh, pushing it out to our GPU accelerated supercomputer. Um, and this is the, what Hokie Speed looks like. It's a 209 node supercomputer with a pair of uh, uh, hex core CPUs and a pair of NVIDIA uh, Tesla Fermi GPUs on it. And so with that, uh, Sorry about running a, a bit over. Uh, the, we, um, I talked about an ecosystem for heterogeneous parallel computing and some enabling software that we're using to tune uh, the parameters of the hardware devices in order to get uh, performance, power, and programmability. And so I'd be remiss without uh, uh, acknowledging a host of people that are involved in this project, um, and my students and a couple of staff. And uh, I'm actually looking for many other postdocs, research associates, or research scientists, uh, positions that I need to fill uh, over the co next coming years. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the people that uh, fund uh, the work that we do. With that, um, you can find out the information at this myriad of uh, plethora of uh, websites. Primarily the Synergy website it will get, capture most of uh, uh, what you're looking for. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, time for a few questions. No questions. Okay, British. Okay. I saw I saw the speed up results that you had for the GPU and the GPU is quite heavy. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? The speed up results that you were showing over the CPU was getting to the 70 times. It seemed quite heavy and I have to do it. Did you tell me anything about the baseline? The baseline, the baseline, that's a very good question. You want to find out what the reference point is. The reference point was a hand chain SSD code, so it was, it was, uh, it was, 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 it Whatever that number is, it would be about 20, 20 volt something. That's a good point there. And yeah, I did that for the artificial wear optimization one. I did it against the hand chain SSD. Um, then later on in the runtime system, I showed it against the 12 core. I, I should have done it for, for both both sets of results for consistency. So, you said something about Tegra. I thought Tegra is basically a mobile. Right. Have you done anything with the mobile uh, platforms or using mobile units? Yeah, we've done uh, an extensive amount of work with the mobile units as part of our NSF Center for High Performance Reconfigurable Computing. The stakeholders in that and the funders of that are very, very much towards the mobile embedded space. Uh, if the desktop space is too high a power. So uh, we haven't worked directly with Hegra yet. We've been working with a lot of APU units. Uh, low power AP units. Um, so we did the, the end body problem that we were showing. Uh, we ran it on an initial APU environment that was 11 watts total, not just the processor, the entire system was 11 watts at idle. And then we went into end body problem that was uh, 19 watts uh, power. But it, of course, comes with a trade off that performance was fairly significantly impacted because instead of 1,600 GPU cores, we only had 80 GPU cores. Uh, on die. 
but what was surprising about that, um, it, it, it didn't matter the N body code, but some of the other codes uh, that are more sensitive to data movement, we found that even though there was one case, I think it was a reduced code, uh, with only 80 cores versus 1,600 cores on the discrete GPU, that we were better off running the code on the integrated fused GPUs on the APU than to move it to the GPU, compute on it, move it back, because we couldn't amortize the data movement overhead, despite the fact there was so much compute capability on the discrete GPU. And so the trick is, with respect to the performance power modeling, can we figure out when it's best to use the GPUs that are on die versus off die? And the, the results I showed, we were showing only with respect to a discrete CPU and discrete GPU. We have some work going on that is also starting to look at uh, providing it for the APU as well, and intermixing that uh, in the decision process. Any other questions? We will have ample time in the break to discuss the time. So thank you once more. Thank you.